Hi, I'm Casey, pastor of Quest Church and Community of Grace. Thanks for making time to watch or listen to this message. If it helps you in some way, let me encourage you to do two things. First, share it with somebody else. Second, if you don't already, consider becoming a financial partner with Quest. We are 100% supported with gifts by people like you. And now, here's today's message. We're glad that you're here. My name's Casey. If you've just walked in in person or if you've just joined us online, we are glad that you're here. Again, we just wrapped up a series last week. You can find all of that on our YouTube channel or church app. We're kind of in the middle of this weird series, unique series that we are kind of sprinkling throughout the fall. And then next week we start that new series called Five Invitations to Connect with God. So uh, hopefully you will be uh, with us for that as well. If you open up or download our church app, there is a button that says notes and you can follow along with today's message. And at the end of it, you can email that to yourself and you can reflect on what you were thinking today uh, later on. And I know for me, uh, I am a note taker. I've got to write stuff down or it is, it's here and it's gone. Uh, but we are back in this series called How to Talk About God. I want to start asking you a question. What would you say if someone asked you, why are you a Christian? Why are you a follower of Jesus? Now, maybe, maybe you're one of those people that you've got your elevator pitch ready to go. You know what I mean? Like a short summary of the major points. You know, there's, there's more below the surface, but you've got something to rattle off right there on the top of your head. Maybe uh, you might uh, rattle off a few Bible verses. Maybe you'd say, you know, hmm, that's, a, that's a good question. I got to think about that some more. Maybe you would just be straight up stumped by the question. How do you tell someone why you're a Christian. Of course, that's assuming you are. Now, I'm convinced that Jesus expects us to answer this question if we are serious about walking the way of Jesus. Faith in Christ shouldn't be something that we, we hold in as a secret. It should be visible, not showy, but visible. Psalm 78 says this, We will not hide what God has done from our descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonders He has done. Jesus underlined this in Matthew 5 when He says, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The Apostle Peter wrote to Christians who were suffering because of their faith. And even then, even then, he says, be open to talking about God. Here's what he says in 1 Peter 3. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. If we're honest, some of us have very negative pictures of what it looks like for a Christian to talk to somebody about their faith. Gentleness and respect are probably absent from those images that we carry with us. Christians, we have a word for uh, talking about our faith, sharing our faith in Christ with other people, and it's called evangelism. Uh, and evangelism is based on the word gospel, which means good news. It's supposed to be good news that we share. However, what a lot of people uh, often hear when we talk about evangelism or when we talk about sharing our faith, they hear the word proselytize, proselytize. 
Uh, People imagine Christians pressuring and forcing people to try to convert to Christianity. That's not what we're after, and I don't believe it's what Jesus was was about or is about today. Uh, You'd be hard-pressed to read in the Gospels Jesus twisting somebody's arm to become his follower. He can ask pointed questions. He can even uh, make some sharp rebukes to religious leaders, but he was always making these creative invitations and letting people know this is good news. In this series, How to Talk About God, I am arguing that sharing Jesus with other people happens when, when three different things come together at an intersection. First, what we talked about already, listening to other people's stories. If you missed that message, please go listen to it on our app. Second, what we're talking about today, sharing your story. And the third thing we're going to talk about in about a month, uh, which is uh, sharing God's story. Those three things come together in a healthy way when we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And today we're asking the question, how do I tell someone why I am a Christian? And to get a little help, we're going to look uh, at Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22. It's a kind of a church history book, the first church history book uh, ever written, and it's in the Bible, the New Testament, right after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to focus on Someone who I think is probably the the most uh, famous convert in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. And, And the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul several times tells us his story of why and how he became a Christian. Uh, He also hints at this several times in the letters that he wrote that are in our Bible too. Today we're looking at Acts 22, and here he is explaining and defending himself to what is frankly a hostile crowd. I want to suggest that by his example, Paul gives us three questions to think about, three questions to answer. And I think if we put some time and thought and prayer into these three questions, they will better help us to talk about God. Let's take a look at what he says, Acts 22, or rather what he does and says. We're going to begin the latter half of verse 2. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. He's talking, by the way, to a very religious Jewish audience. Verse 4, I persecuted the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison, as the high priest and the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Let's pause. So, first question. First question we get by Paul's example. What's your story? What's your story? What is your life story? Now, Paul tells a little bit of his life story in that passage. And if you study the book of Acts, you'll see he, you know, he, he shares different bits each time depending on who he is talking to. Um, he only shares part of it. Um, he doesn't share all of his life story. I mean, uh, only your therapist has time for that, and they get paid to do that. All right, All right. come on, guys. That's, that was my sorry attempt at a joke. Be grateful it wasn't a dad joke, all right? All right, but he shares what's relevant to the audience at hand. And if you read his letters, you'll get other little bits and pieces of his story. Here he says, for example, I studied under the the great Jewish teacher Gamaliel. Elsewhere he says, I was a Pharisee, if you had to figure out which denomination I belonged to. By Paul's example, we're encouraged to know our own story. Know thyself, as the old Greek proverb goes. Think about your life. What what stands out? What's interesting? 
What got you from first grade to your first job? Know your story and share some of that story with people when you talk about God. Share your story because it's interesting. Share it because it's honest. It's authentic. It connects with other people. Uh, Seeing Christians as unrelatable is one of the things that can be off-putting to people who are not Christians. And uh, seeing Christians pretend that they are not like their non-Christian neighbors also turns people off too. Both being put up on too high a pedestal and then pretending that that's where we belong. Nobody wants to be a part of that. But telling your story in a way that shows people that you share connection points with them. You, you've been through some of the same ups and downs that they have. You are flesh and blood. So think about what is some of my own life story. Let's look at the second question here. And to do that, a little bit longer part of the story here, beginning with verse 6 through 16. Paul says, About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground, heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I said. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on Jesus' name. Second question that we get from Paul's example here, how did you become a Christian. Paul moves from Jesus hater to Jesus follower, and, and it's, it's dramatic. It's dramatic, and it's unusual, and he knows it's unusual. But in some of his letters, he's like, I, I know I did not become an apostle. I did not become a disciple in the way that some of the other apostles came to follow Jesus. My story is very unusual. However, for better or worse, Many Christians compare how they become a Christian to Paul's story. We we compare our journey to his. And and some churches, and I grew up in a church like this, I'm not speaking ill of, I'm just naming the, the, the fact. Some churches emphasize an exact moment when a Christ, person becomes a Christian. And there's nothing wrong with that. You, you might be asked, you know, when did you, when were you saved? And guess what? Some people know the answer. Some people can tell you. They could say, you know, I remember, I can remember my life before knowing Jesus. I remember I prayed and, and, I, and I said, Jesus, I, I want you to save me. I, I want you to be my Lord. And I was baptized right after that. And, and my life was totally different after that. Some people know that. And that's great. Uh, Some people, though, don't know the exact day and time. And frankly, I think that that's okay, too. See, I'm convinced that becoming a Christian is a process marked by milestones. I think there are times where, where God is doing some very undramatic stuff when we're not really paying attention And then there are these moments where we go, holy moly, God is doing something right now. And we respond to it. And those are memorable moments. 
Um, it, for, for some of you, it might be the moment you were baptized. Maybe the moment you went through confirmation or uh, maybe a week at church camp was meaningful in your becoming a Christian. Maybe it was a small group that you were part of or maybe a church retreat that you were a part of. Some people remember, they can remember when Jesus meant nothing to them and then they can remember when they first loved Jesus. Other people simply know that in their family, they were taught that loving and trusting Jesus was just the normal thing that we do. And, and, and they couldn't tell you when that happened, but standing where they are right now, they could say, oh yeah, absolutely, I'm on team Jesus. <laughs> I'm trusting him, I'm following him. So how did that happen for you? What did that look like? That's interesting to people. Third question, third and final question, how does Jesus make your life better? Now, Paul is kind of brief about it in this telling of the story. He mentions at the end uh, that God washed away my, my sins. I don't mean to undermine that at all. Paul talks a lot about that in his letters, how important that is, what a difference it makes in our lives, but he just doesn't spend a lot of time on it here. There's another interesting spot, though, in one of his letters where he, he, he talks about this a little more, and it's in his letter to the Philippians, Philippians 3. And there, there Paul goes in and he talks about all of the stuff that he was doing before he knew anything about Jesus. And, and he talks about stuff that, frankly, he was pretty proud of. It wasn't like, oh, man, you know, I woke up drunk in the gutter. No, he's like, I had the best education. I, 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 I was like number one in, in my Hebrew Bible class. I was the strictest Kid, I mean, you did not want to face me down if we had to have a Bible memory competition. I mean, that was Paul. But, but, but this is what he says. He says, then I met Jesus, and this is what he says in Philippians 3, verse 8. Listen to this. He says, I consider everything, I consider all of that a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Paul says, my family history, my college degree, all my years of seminary and ministry training, he said, all of that is worthless in comparison to being with Jesus. He was convinced that Jesus made his life today and his life after death better. Now, Paul suffered intense physical pain after becoming a follower of Jesus. He lost a lot of friends because of that. He was misunderstood and mistreated in service to Jesus. And yet, and yet, with all of that being true, he still said it is better to know Jesus Christ. It's all worth it. So what about you? How does Jesus make your life better? It, do, do you celebrate and just get worked up about that forgiveness of sins? Are you just overwhelmed when you realize God's great love for you. Does it just excite you to think about this connection you have to the Christian family in the church? Do you celebrate knowing that Jesus gives you wisdom for the hard choices of life? Maybe some of these, maybe all of them. But the question is, how does Jesus make your life better? And guess what? The way you answer that today may be a little different a year from now. It may have been different five years ago. It may be different ten years from now. People want to know what's happening in your life lately. How does Jesus make your life better? And, and whatever that answer is, by the way, that gives you a what Dr. Mark Teasdale calls a good bias. 
Right? We always talk about bias as a negative thing. But he says, you, have a, you could have a good bias for something. And when you have a good bias for something, you want to talk to other people about it. You've probably got a good bias for your favorite food, your favorite spot to go vacation, your favorite author. And when you talk to somebody about that, it doesn't feel weird. You're not like, oh, man, huh. Scott, I don't know if I'm going to talk to Scott about my favorite book. You know, maybe, maybe he'll think I'm a weirdo. I don't know. Maybe he's not into this. He'll be offended. But I texted somebody just the other day. I said, hey, have you read this book? They're like, no. What's it about? And I tell them, they're like, I'm going to have to add that to my, to my, my to-read list. I had a good bias toward it. What, what, what has Jesus done to give you the good bias? All right, let's wrap it up. Recap on these three questions. What's your story? How did you become a Christian? How does Jesus make your life better? The bottom line is this. Know your story and share your story. Look, I'm not telling you you have to uproot and move to another community to do this. I'm not saying uh, dress up in a, in a suit and tie and knock on all your neighbor's doors and ask them, hey, Robin, do you know Jesus? Another Robin, Robin, do you know Jesus? Aaron, do you know Jesus? Dave, do you know Jesus? You don't have to do that. It's not what I'm telling you to do. I'm asking you to, to, to have thought through and have some answers to these and be open when those opportunities present themselves. Because then you'll be better able to talk about God. So take some time to do that. You might want to write them down. Just try to process your, your thoughts. You may even then want to try to share it with somebody you trust, you're comfortable with, maybe another Christian friend. Maybe you say, Chapin, you know, hey, let's, let's share our stories. And I'd love to hear how you became a Christian. Why does Jesus matter to you? And then, you know, I'll, I'll tell you why he matters to me. And just begin to get a feel for what it's like to, to share that. And just so we can say I practice some of what I preach, let me tell you a little bit about my story. How might I answer some of those questions? I was raised uh, in a family where I was the oldest child of, of two. Um, and my family, we went to church off and on as I was a kid. That means sometimes it was on and we were there for a year or two and then sometimes it was off and we just we weren't but somewhere around the age of 10 I remember being at a church service we had a guest preacher there at the time and uh, he was just straight up telling people about Jesus why Jesus matters what it means to be a Christ follower and the difference it makes and then at the end he made an invitation he said does anybody here want to place their trust in Jesus today and uh, we had everybody praying, and he just said, if that's you, just raise your hand up. And I remember being 10 years old, I raised my hand up, said, that's me. He walked us through a model prayer where we could say, Jesus, I, I want you to save me, uh, and I want you to be the Lord of my life. And then in our church, after you did that, um, after all the anonymity of everybody's heads bowed, and you, know, you raise your hand up, then you got to walk down the aisle and stand in front of everybody, and then they introduce you. But I remember I, I got to talk to the pastor after that just to kind of get a sense, did he know what, what this 10-year-old was signing up for? And apparently, uh, I gave a good answer because I was baptized uh, shortly thereafter. And that was a milestone moment for me. God was at work before that, and then there's this milestone. For the, for the next few years as I go into adolescence, that was a process of me deciding that uh, I want to take some ownership of this. I want to be more responsible for my faith. Uh, and it's just, you know, the, the kind of the, the repetitive stuff, going to church week in and week out, going to youth group, reading my Bible, learning how to pray. I remember devotional books that I would read and even journal about. And going to church camp was also part of my story. And I remember when I was about 17, I was at a church camp when I had a what, what people would call a religious experience. I am convinced God spoke to me. Uh, in, in a very unique way. And in that time, God called me to go into ministry. I didn't know what kind of ministry, but I could tell you, I was certain I would not be a pastor. Because I looked at pastors and I thought, those are the least cool people on the planet. <laughs> and you might be saying, and he was right. <laughs> But, but
But that was a milestone moment for me to say, to say yes to that. And over the next few years, going off and, and studying and, and getting educated and really studying about what, what is the Christian faith? What is it? What does it mean? How does all of this make sense together? I mean, what are the, what are the problems with it? Are there good answers for the challenges that come up to it? Is this true? And, and, and I, I studied all of those things. I remember studying church history and knowing, hey, there's some good stuff that happened here. Or there's some bad stuff, some really ugly stuff that happens in here too. Christians did some really awful things. And yet, in, in spite of all of that, still being convinced that Jesus is true. And I became convinced that that Jesus was crucified by the Romans and that he said, I'm doing this for you and that the only explanation that made sense to me of of what happened after he died was was that he, he really was raised back to life by the power of God. To me, that's the only thing that made sense. And, and as I've continued my life, I've had my ups and my downs. I've had my, my doubts. But I remain convinced that, that if Jesus really was raised from the dead, then, then what he said must be true. And the things that he said about himself and that his followers said about him must be true as well. And, and as I've gone through life and thought about, well, what if I weren't a Christian? You know, like, how would I approach life? To me, Jesus is what makes the most sense of life. And, 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 a, and a quote that C.S. Lewis wrote about 75 years ago is, is what summarizes it best for me. He said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. I believe in Christianity as I believe that as the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And for me, it's Jesus that makes, that sheds light on on all of our other experiences, the good, the bad, and the, the ugly. And I'd also say now that after 42 years of life, I can look back and, and I can see I have been far from perfect, and I'm far from perfect now. But by the grace of God, I do believe I'm better than what I would have been without Jesus. That's my story. What's your story? Let's pray. God, we are grateful for the good news of Jesus. God, there may be some uh, listening here who who, who are, would say, I, I am a Christian, I am a follower of Jesus. And sometimes we just, we lose sight of how good this news is. God, w- would you make us excited about it again? Would you help us to think back on what you've been doing in our own lives? Think about our life story and, and how we became a follower of Christ and, and, and what good Jesus has done in our lives. It doesn't have to sound the same as our neighbor, it won't. But God, would you rekindle a, a fresh spark of excitement about Jesus in us? Make us more aware of what that good news is and make us open to sharing it. God, there may be people here uh, today uh, or, or, or listening to this message who would say, I, I don't know if I'm a Christian or, or I'm not, but maybe I, I'm ready to do that today. And, and God, I just want to give them the opportunity I had when I was 10 just to offer a model prayer as a first step in saying yes to Jesus. And so if that's you, I just would encourage you to pray these words, either in the quiet of your own heart or even just softly in a whisper. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for loving me. I'm sorry for all of the wrong I've done. I'm sorry for my sin. I trust you now to save me. You and you alone. 
I want to trust you to be the Lord of my life. I want to follow your wisdom. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can walk in the way of Jesus. Jesus.